According to the World Resources Institute's Aqueduct Water Risk Atlas, a quarter of the world's population faces an extremely high water stress each year. An additional one billion people are expected to be affected by the year 2050. Extremely high water stress means countries use almost all of their water. Well, retired Captain Moses A. West is founder of the Moses West Foundation. He developed technology that pulls water from the atmosphere. Moses joins me from Chicago to explain atmospheric water generation. Moses, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. You look like hey, you got a perfect setting. We're talking about water. You in front some water. Tell me a little bit about this creation that really has just some stunning um, uh, attributes to it because people, you know, don't realize if we remember back, water comes in three forms, right? Liquid, solid, gas, and you are taking that and you are actually creating water. How exactly are you doing that? Oh, uh, thank you for having me on the show to start with. Uh, yeah, and, and also, I, I also like walking and talking, so this is really good for me. I just finished doing a radio show. Hey, um, the, uh, the water in its gaseous state that we have it in the atmosphere, it's the most plentiful state. Like here I am right now, uh, next to this waterfall in Chicago, this fountain, mm -hmm. and Lake Michigan, it's, the air is very humid. It's going to be, um, it's going to be 109, 110 degrees tomorrow at um, at O'Hare in Midway uh, Airport. So that's going to mean that there's a lot of water that's going to be in the atmosphere. And so what I've done is I've created a technology that allows you to pull that moisture, to condense that moisture out of the air the same way that you take a glass in the middle of the summertime and you put that uh, cold glass, that cold bottle of Coke on the table, you've all done it, and that, and that bottle of Coke just continues to sweat, right? Yes. Well, with that picture that you see of the machine right there pushing that water out, that machine does that using, a mechan using mechanical techniques that I've created over the years to efficiently pull that moisture out of the air uh, uh, with a lower energy consumption than you can use, than is needed to pull it out of the ground. So basically, that box that you see in that picture, you can sit it right here, and everybody in this park in uh, Chicago could drink from, from that water for the next forever. Now, this box that we are looking at, it's solar powered, I would imagine. Absolutely, it's solar powered. But also, what I did was I. Uh, the big box that you see, I put on there a, uh, a generator. So it's got its own internal generator in case you don't have solar power. So basically, you could take that box anywhere. You could drop it where you need it in the world, and you could turn it on, and you could produce water. And we're, we've already done that. We did it in Flint, Michigan, and we did it on the island of Vieques in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. And, that and box that you see, go on. Yes, yes, the box that we see. Yeah, that box is uh, supplied the 4th Ward in Flint, Michigan. I built two of those. One supplied the 4th Ward with all their drinking water. We allowed people who were homeless, who couldn't clean their houses, to move back in their homes because we could give them one, two, three hundred gallons of water a day that they needed, and then the machine would make water again. And then on the island of Yankees, we uh, ran it on solar power, and we produced enough water for 15,000 people to drink without the need of FEMA having to ship water in to Vieques. And we did that on solar power. And that's very important. You talked about uh, FEMA, and, and when we talk about the federal government getting involved, you are really providing a, a huge resource, resource, not just to places that have uh, been struck by some type of uh, uh, act of nature, but when we talk about Native Americans and their inability to have access to water, there are people who have never really drunk their water from their faucets. They have lived for decades on bottled water. You are coming into places like that, and you are making water accessible. And I think it's something that people take for granted, the water that we drink all day or the half a bottles of water that we throw away. People around the world do not have it. Talk to me about what you did in Puerto Rico, for example, that allowed the community to just do better and be better because of the machine that you created. Well, in Puerto Rico, when I, when I got to Puerto Rico, their water system was already contaminated. 
the water that's on the island. Uh, they have to chlorinate it truly heavily to get it to be drinkable. I met some people, just a couple stores. I met a guy who was drinking water from a pipe that ran underneath the cemetery. He was so desperate, wow. he drank the water on the other side. He got some kind of an intestinal problem, uh, gastrointestinal problem. They had to cut him open to just to let it, just to let it fester out of his body. I met uh, Tahino Indians, Native Americans, that uh, uh, were bleeding from their eyes, from their gums, uh, swollen stomachs. And when we started to produce the water on the island, I had to explain to everybody that this water was already there because it was in the, the moisture and the humidity in the air that was around them. And so in Puerto Rico, we set the machine up and basically liquid, solid, and gas is the only three ways the water comes. And we produce water for the entire island after Hurricane Maria. So the people there accepted the technology, but I had to explain to them that where it was coming from because nobody believed me that it was pulling out of the air. Right, right. And you know, it's a concept that I think people understand. Um, listen, I know as a black woman, we understand that there is moisture in the air and we yes. protect our hairstyles. <laughs> and we, trust me, we get that. We know when that moisture, you go down to New Orleans, you are, have a different hair plan than you do when you're maybe up in New Jersey or Miami. But the bottom yep. line is that you are correct. It affects and, and it, you can pull water from the air. How much water does this machine process, let's say, over, over a day or over an hour? How do you break down the gallons that it processes and how fast? 1,250 gallons of water a day. That's 5,000 liters. Wow. Wow. And as, and as long as I'm pulling the water out of the air and people are taking it, the machine continues to fill up as you, as you empty it. If I pull out 200 gallons of water, <laughs> You sit there long enough, it'll make that 200 gallons back. So wow. when you're removing water, it's continuously refilling the machine. Along this endless supply. Yes, yes. Along this process, you are also eliminating food deserts. Tell me how you're uh, doing that. Well, uh, say like say like here in a place like this in Chicago. Say you have this this tree line over here. Okay, that tree line over there. Say if you're you're not producing any water here, we have all the water in the air. Well, if I pull the water out of the air using sunlight to produce the water, then that pure water is used to grow food. That is 100% sustainable. So you're pulling the water from the air using solar power to grow food. If you built that closed off over there, all you'd have to do is come back and just grow, pick up the food. It's that simple. Wow. Greenhouse, water generator, solar panels, food. You don't even have to touch it. Just put little cameras in there and let all the kids around the United States see the plants grow. And, and this water that's generated, does it have to be processed in any way once it's gathered or you take it as is in terms of just the, what, what is the process that it goes through in order to make it usable if there is one? Oh, the, when the machine is, when, when the machine is, is, when I deploy a machine and it's fresh, it's brand new, it's clean, all the filters are clean, I can drain the water directly off the coil. But go, going by federal guidelines, as you can see, everything is green. Everything is green because I make equipment for the military. So the military has the technology in use. So uh, it goes just through basic carbon filtration. And then you can control the pH of the water by how much carbon filtration you add or subtract. You can add ozone emitters, to, uh, ozone transmitters to the, to the water system. You can add chlorinators. You can tailor the water to what you would like to have it. Uh, because what you're doing is you're taking water from its pure source as you make it so you can do with it what you want. You know, I think we really have to acknowledge just the fact that you came up with this. What, what is your background and when did this come to you that this was something that you should take on and then how did you actually carry out this idea from beginning to what we're seeing on the screen right now? Well, it, it started out as a... Uh, as a kid, uh, growing up in Texas, we had a, we called it the land of a thousand springs. So when I was a little kid, we could actually pick up, uh, we could actually drink water as it came out of the ground. We could jump into the creeks and we could swim. We could go fishing. So that's what, that's what I grew up with. And then in the military, I was stationed in places where we wouldn't get supplied with water sometimes. And then once in Saudi Arabia, 
it was so hot that I was like, if I don't get, a, if we don't get a water supply, I'm gonna jump in this helicopter and I'm gonna fly someplace where there is some water mm. because we're not gonna survive. It was 150 degrees. Wow. And then I lived in Australia for 11 years. In Australia, they have a thing called toilet to tap. I got back one year to, uh, uh, I came, I was always coming back and forth to the States. And then I got to uh, Australia one time and we were drinking water from the, uh, uh, we were drinking water that just had filtered and turned around from the toilet back to the tap. And then I saw the, uh, what the drought had done to the country. I saw acres and acres of dead trees because the salt water had creeped back into the ground uh, from the ocean because they pulled up so much fresh water. And seeing all these things, all these different situations around the world uh, with, the, with the degradation of pure water, the degradation of our groundwater, and knowing that the atmosphere was full of water because we're always living in this humidity, I decided that, you know, I saw this little machine in Hawaii, and I said, if it, someone can make a little machine, mm. I could definitely make a big one. Yeah, and and that, that you did. I want to go to our panel. I'm sure that they're as intrigued as I am. Let me start with you, Randy. What question do you have for really this professor of water, if you will? I just first have to express how much in awe I am of you, Mr. West. This is incredible what you've created. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that my grandchildren will be reading about you in science class when we talk about inventors one day. Um, so thank you for your contribution. To this, to this entire world. So how do you connect with communities? Um, this water shortage is already evidencing itself in many areas. You mentioned Flint, Michigan. I think about what recently just happened in Jackson, Mississippi. How do communities get in touch with you um, to get your have the solution available to them? Well, I started out, when I first started out doing this, uh, as is anything in the United States when you have a really good idea. People are sometimes here in this country are, are going to try to take what you have. And uh, I've, I've went through that. But what I've always tried to do is I've always tried to connect with just making sure that the, the average man and woman on the street understands what this technology is and how it works. And so that, that groundswell of grassroots connections that I've made over the past 10 years has, has risen up and gotten to the, you know, the highest levels to get you with, to NBC, ABC, and CBS, and, uh, and CNN, and the, and the Washington Post, just by doing humanitarian work. So uh, mainly that's how, and through my foundation, the Moses West Foundation, uh, that's, uh, donations came through there, got me to Puerto Rico, got me to Flint, got me to Jackson, Mississippi, and helps me to educate people about this technology. Dr. Brown, question for Moses. Yeah, M Moses, I, I, you know, I want to say how incredible this is. I think that, you know, your name is Moses like the Bible, but it's more mm -hmm. like a modern day Noah as an engineer, um, except for instead of an ark, you built a, a machine that creates water to, out of thin air. Um, I think that's incredible. I mean, my, my, my question is, when is your next invention going to turn that water into wine? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you can already do that. <laughs> You could already make alcohol with it. Nice, with it. <laughs> He's a step ahead of you. you. Know, there you go. Well, all, all jokes aside, I think that um, you know you and your generator are important for you know for Black people specifically because of the positive impact that um, that you've had uh, in your technology. Uh, you know, looking at places that you affected, like Flint and like Jackson, uh, Mississippi. This is huge. My question is. I'm sure when you first started to create this, right, seeing the small version um, and having the, the creativity and sort of the imagination to make a large version of this type of technology, I'm sure you had some people that were very skeptical. Can you talk about some of that uh, skepticism that people might have had <laughs> as the process? I've had some PhDs come up to me and say, hey, if you run this machine, you're going to take, it's going to change the entire environment of the world. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> See, there is no way, no way mm -hmm. you could take all the humidity off of Lake Michigan, off of the Pacific Ocean, making trillions of gallons of water, considering from the surface to 10,000 feet, it is nothing, that's called the troposphere, and it's nothing but a water superhighway, and 
The hotter the planet gets, what happens? The more water evaporates. And water, guess what? H2O is a greenhouse gas. So the more, the hotter the planet gets, the more water that's in the atmosphere, the better these machines work. So that's one of the blowbacks that I got was people thinking that it was going to take too much water. The other blowback I got was people said this machine wouldn't work. Mm. So if you look at every machine that I build, there's windows on the machines. Do you know why? So what? people can look inside that window uh -huh. and see the water being made because they said, some people said, oh, you just filled it up with water. <laughs> wow. Wow. Talk about the skeptics. Oh, wow. So, so I have to put windows on the machines. And the only thing the Marines asked me, told me to do is says, Moses, the next time you build machines for us, make bigger windows so we can have more Marines look at it at one time. Yeah, and that's hey, listen, that's an exciting field trip for a lot of kids to see that water being made, I would imagine, too. Jesse, your question. Uh, Mr. West, I just wanted to say, first of all, you're a genius, and I'm sure you already know that. But if you haven't heard it already, I just wanted to make sure you know. Um, I'm curious, um, given the fact that there are so many corporate entities or whatnot who are involved in water, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious as some of the blowback that you've gotten from some of the people who may not necessarily want you to bring what you're doing into the community, and how have you handled it, and what ways can we help you circumnavigate those situations? Uh, no blowback. The only blowback I've gotten is from uh, people trying to steal it from me, uh, former business partners, that kind of blowback. That's it. But so far, it's like um, uh, corporations, none at all. Uh, working closely with the United States military on the technology, if they tell me that, if they tell me that there's something they want me to do in the way of the design of the machine, I can definitely do that. I can change that design up for them. Uh, add to it, subtract to it, make it a different size, make it harder. So uh, with me and this technology so far, it's just been very positive because one, I think no one thought I would ever succeed at it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one thing. They thought I would just kind of be a, a flash in the pan and go away. And um, so I've been at it for 10 years and here I am and my biggest customer is the United States military. Moses, how long from the beginning, you said 10 years, uh, now, now it's out there, but when did your first working product hit the market and what did it take to get venture capitalists to buy into your idea? Well, the first venture capitalist that bought into my idea actually tried to take my company from me. Uh -huh. so, uh, so I stayed away from venture capital and I did it all on my, with, my, with the profit from uh, what I made within my company. And then I did things uh, philanthropically with the uh, Moses West Foundation, strictly on donations from people uh, to get machine to get that machine to Puerto Rico and stay there. The, the, the only reason I had to come home from Puerto Rico is because the FEMA director told me, he said, Moses, you got to be alive to create more work <laughs> because I was I was working uh, mm. uh, every day, seven days a week, uh, 12, 15 hours a day. And so. The, tech, the technology so far, progressing it the way that I've done it, I've done it all on my own. But right now, I've got, uh, I've just now brought on a uh, managing director. And uh, we're taking orders in right now for these large machines that you see right there mm -hmm. for 2024. We're building some right now. We're building a, a few for Peru. Wow. We're building two for, um, we're building two for uh, Maui to go to Hawaii for the situation that they just had there to make sure that the Native Americans can stay on their lands. And we're also working with the Native American Council here in the United States to uh, build some machines for uh, uh, the Native American homelands here as well. Moses, you mentioned Flint, Michigan earlier. You know, we don't see that in the headlines a lot. I'm sure that you're close to the pulse of things there. What, what is the situation there with their water and where did you factor into that? Well, when we were in the fourth ward in Flint, Michigan, the, the people would donate water to Flint. And so when the water donations came in, people would announce where those were and people would go show up to get the water. And there would be a line of cars a mile long. They would get a few cases of water. The water would run out. Then everybody would be left out. But after we were there long enough and people understood that we were never running out of water and they didn't have to take 
20 or 30 gallons of water home with them. They, they said, well, can I just come here and get two or three gallons? Mm. I said, take as many gallon water jugs as you want. Every time you need water, just walk over here to the machine, fill it up. Let me show you how to do it. Take ownership of the machine. I'll be here to help you if you need it. So I sat there in my chair, and then sometimes the sister tour would sit there. Latoya Ruby Frazier came out, took pictures, and she did a whole, uh, put it in the, she put it in a book, uh, Flint and Three Acts. So Moses is actually the third act in her book. And then, uh, so it was a, it was an easy process to get the machine incorporated into the community by giving community, the community ownership of the technology. And so it was, uh, they, there was no need for water in the fourth ward. Wow, wow. Moses, Moses West, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. And not only just telling us about what you've been doing, but really teaching us in the process, the same way that you taught those people in Flint, Michigan. You're not just history in the making, you have already made history. And I thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much. Good to see you too. Thank you.